Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and very happy to be here. Um, so yes, we're getting, we're, we're kind of, it seems to me like uh, here we are folk get, getting down to the, uh, the nitty gritty as it was described. And I guess um, I want to begin by um, taking the opportunity to highlight some areas of uh, you know, common ground with previous speakers, as well as potential areas that I'm struggling with. Uh, and I don't want to go into the, um, the, the question time spot, but I know I won't get to ask any. Um, so I won't, uh, just, so a few things, uh, relevance of, of this subject to, to some of the things that have already been uh, uh, spoken about before, which will enable me to go quite rapidly over things that we've already covered and I agree with and focus on stuff that's additional to that, I guess. So, so Sean talked a lot about, and indeed I think Ruth did too, the dangers of a toxic culture and the importance of collaboration. I'm going to talk about that quite clearly around um, buyer supply relationships. Um, Sean also talked, uh, talked about uh, focus and the importance of focus, which I'm going to come back to specifically as I'm going to talk about SMEs. So maybe there's the, the thing about my presentation is I'm going to draw on SMEs. Uh, and I'm struggling, Sean, with the fact that, however, you referred to food policy as critical and that this food policy was going to deal with social welfare, GDP, employment and trade all at once. So I think that's a policy that's destined to fail if you're trying to hit so many targets. Ben was talking about working with one-man bands through to global players. Uh, so I'm going to talk about supermarkets here, so the retail environment where supermarkets are trying to reach out and accommodate very small businesses as well as uh, global giants uh, and Michelle um, I, I couldn't help thinking just how dysfunctional um, our industry is uh, and that's partly reflected I think in those horrendous um, or, or alarming um, trust indicators and the consequence yeah uh, yes yeah, enough so um, <laughs> in case I, I won't get to ask those questions but I will get to debate some of that stuff maybe with Sean uh, and others too so I am going to talk about a specific piece of research I'm a cons I am a I am an academic um, but I, I like to think of myself as a kind of a streetwise academic I spent a lot of time working with practitioners different parts of the supply chain of, over the last 30 years I'm an, I'm an applied microeconomist and the more, the more applied the economist becomes, the less economics there is, because economics is about the efficient allocation of scarce resources and makes a whole bunch of assumptions about how that's going to happen in the real world called business, which is another reason why I think uh, it's interesting that the picture that um, Sean painted is a fantastic one but it's an illusion of reality. Uh, and we've been talking about those things for 30 years, and it feels to me like I almost had some slides that I was sharing with students 20 years ago, and I'm thinking, they're just as good now as they were then, or just as good bad, or just as bad, because so little has changed. So I'm going to talk about one specific bit of research that I've been involved with uh, for the last decade, but in a sense, I'm drawing on evidence from around the world in different parts of the supply chain. A bit of context. I'm then going to bring in a couple of elements of theory. Uh, we've got a quasi-academic audience here, haven't we? Or you might, or more than that. Um, so you'll appreciate a bit of theory, strategic orientation and organisational justice. Share with you uh, a couple of slides on, on what, we, what we discovered over the last few years and then, and then wrap it all up. Um, so the contextual piece where I'm coming from um, is um, the context, which is, again, maybe uh, this elusive goal, sustainable competitive advantage. Some um, similarities, perhaps, with, um, with Sean's um, concept of sustainable um, intensification. But I think what, it's difficult, I mean, in, in, in an environment with CEOs, um, few of them can argue with the fact that if we can add more value at lower cost, faster than the competition, without destroying the planet or people anywhere in the supply chain, that's a really compelling and winning formula. And then they, are, and then they kind of sit there quietly or we have a debate about why they can't do that. And sometimes it's because we're focused on efficiency and therefore get left behind by those that are adding more value. Or we're focused, I mean, the food security argument is an interesting one too. So if we're concerned about food security, why would we have a policy that's designed to get more, more food exports? Because that's actually get food... You know, anyway. uh, so, uh, and of course, some people are willing to pay for this stuff, but people don't do what they say. So beware reliance on credence attributes because we all care about the world, we all care about the planet, we all care about where stuff comes from, we all assume that it's safe, 
Uh, we all, and we all care about nutrition, by the way. Two-thirds of people, if you ask them, will say they'll check their labels to make sure they're eating, uh, eating healthily, and yet we know that two-thirds of adults are obese. So I'm not going to go and say it's BS, but we, uh, the evidence is in what people do, not what people say. And in but, back to the kind of starting point, um, this is a great uh, strategy. Uh, but you can't. But organisations can't do it by themselves. So I'm full square uh, aligned with uh, Sean here that part of the problem with our industry is that it is dysfunctional. Collaboration in whichever direction you want to look at um, has failed miserably, almost at every link in the supply chain. I'm exaggerating a wee bit to make the point because you can always show examples of best best practice. But I struggle to see the link between what was it? Um, <laughs> what was it? It was Boeing, the, the engine in the aeroplane, with a supermarket and a bag of carrots. They're not the same thing. So do, really, do people really care uh, where their carrots come from and how they've grown? They say they do, but they don't when it comes to paying more for it. They'll very quickly find where the carrots are cheapest and go there fast. Or have it delivered to them quicker. <laughs> worrying, worrying this trend towards e-commerce and the disconnection between the people buying the food, consuming the food and where it's come from. Because in theory, e-commerce makes that connection more possible. In reality, our brains switch off. The psychologists in the room will know all about type one and top type two thinking, as does Dan Ariely. And we don't think rationally about food. It's a fast moving consumer good. We spend nanoseconds at the counter. We spend nanoseconds as we're on our, on, our, on our laptops ordering stuff. We're not paying anything like the attention that is assumed by various people um, about where stuff comes from and how it's produced. It suits us to believe that because that's what our strategy is based on. And if, this, if that is the case, it will fail. There you go. So the paradigm shift, <laughs> just trying to inject a bit. Oh, a bit more, a bit, con <laughs> bit more controversy. Calm down, Fern. So uh, the paradigm shift that... Some of us would like to believe is happening, others would argue is uh, necessary, uh, but it seems to me from what we've had so far today, is isn't happening at anything like the pace that's happening in other sectors or anything like at the rate at which it should. So where are we stuck uh, with this sector of ours or this industry of ours? I think we're still stuck with far too many in this position. Uh, luckily, I've shrunk the images so you can't see the smiling faces. They're not meant to be happy because no one's making any money. Um, relationships are opportunistic. We say one thing, we do something else. We buy today, we sell tomorrow. We maximise the margin if we're lucky. The information flow is opaque. We don't share anything with anybody because we think having information is valuable and then we do nothing with it. How dumb is that? Uh, and then the, the business or the material flow is based on we've got this stuff, who wants it? We're still in that paradigm. I went from Kent to Norfolk five years ago, the basket case, no, the basket region of the country, and it's full of farmers that just want to do what they've always done and are simply paralysed by Brexit, paralysed by the end of the basic payment system scheme and don't know what to do. And they just wish someone would sort it out. And, the, and they, on, the east, on the West Coast, they wish some would have sought out these stupid vegans and these stupid people that don't understand that what we do is valuable. And we all know who needs sorting out. It's not them, it's upstream primary producers that are totally disenfranchised uh, from, uh, detached from the sector which they uh, uh, seek to serve. So what we're trying to head towards is this kind of value chain model. Do you see we've got rubbers on the wheels, we've got a consumer pulling this thing, and now they're all jolly happy because relationships are collaborative. That enables information to be shared because I trust you, you trust me, so you can see my spreadsheets. I had, a, I had a potato farmer uh, waxing lyrical, no he wasn't, he was moaning like crazy, um, <laughs> that, you know, oh God, why did we give up the days of trading our potatoes? Why did we, um, why were we hoodwinked into dropping our drawers? No, revealing our costs to the supermarkets in promise that we would get a guaranteed return. Cost plus accounts, cost plus pricing. Um, so we wanted this, I'm desperately for it, were we, because the peaks of the one in X years 
uh, cycle where we made some money. We're getting lower and lower and longer and longer. So we'll go for this option in the hope that they're going to treat us differently. Uh, and to some extent that happened, but in many cases it didn't. But the material flow in this world is value adding. So that's exactly where I think Sean is talking about. We need to be looking for differentiation. We need to add value. But more than half of the households in this country are described in terms of their postcode by words like low income, less affluent. And what's really interesting about that comment about, um, I think it was plastics, I can't remember now, um, that just because people are poor doesn't mean to say they don't care, that they can't afford to pay. If you're a business uh, and people care but can't afford to, then you won't make money if you're trying to get them to uh, pay the premium because they can't. Doesn't mean it's even interested. So willingness to pay is, does not equate to what people actually do. I'm, I'm um, now repeating myself. So supermarkets are feeling the pressure um, because of Just Eat and Co. Taking more of our uh, taking more of our spend on food out of the supermarkets um, into takeaways, and because. The two fastest growing distribution channels currently in this country are discounters, who together now account for almost 10% of total grocery sales. A, de a decade ago, that was less than 5%, and e-commerce. So Amazon are coming. Everybody's you know, doing things in their underwear because they're not quite sure what to do. And as a, part, as a result of that, we're seeing these giants um, consolidating because we don't know how to make money. So particularly, it's interesting in grocery e-commerce, grocery e billions of dollars globally being pumped into e-commerce and hardly anybody making any money. It's a winner-take-all game because the ones with the deepest pockets will end up mopping up. They will have robots going, Waitrose is already doing it. You give them access to your kitchens, they'll go into your, uh, or the data, the data will uh, trigger the order from Waitrose and the trusted Waitrose delivery person uh, will come into your home and fill up your, fill up your kitchen. Uh, your, your, and whilst that didn't happen, I could have had Tesco and Brooker, etc. So, feeling the pressure, I'm getting to the point, honestly. Uh, so less is more. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to shine a light into the, the, the dark and dirty world of, 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 of commercial reality, if you're a small business. So, and actually if you're a big business, uh, and if you're a small business working with a big business, uh, you assume that the big business has got all the resources and should be behaving better and doing more things, sharing more with us to help us survive as a small business. Well, they're struggling to survive too. It's just at a different level. So what do we see? All retailers around the world, exaggerating to make the point, are rationalising their ranges. Products are being removed. As a result, some businesses are going bankrupt, going bust because they were dependent upon them. So what was that, five years ago now, Tesco announced their 30% reduction in stock keeping unit, units, Tesco project reset. It continues to happen. Why? Because they have precious real estate called shelves that they're not going to waste with products that don't sell. And they don't want to make the mission for shoppers more confusing than it needs to be by having 15 varieties of new potatoes when two will do. And if we go from 15 to 2, we, act, we provide the suppliers with loads more shelf space and we can negotiate much better deals. A rational, very rational reason for why we're going to reduce the number of products. And then for the small business that wants help and wants support and wants more transparency and information sharing, uh, is faced with, with a robot or nobody or not enough people in head office because... These big businesses up and down the supply chain are reducing their headcount to reduce their cost. So lots of people no longer there to answer emails and answer the phone call. And if you are a small business supplying 15 stores in Tesco, basically with, a, with an average penetration of less than 1% of all Tesco shoppers in those stores, <coughs> if they remove you, nobody will care. And that's normally three months after you were celebrating with your partner at home because you won the Tesco contract. With no, with no budget for marketing, with no notion of where my product is going to go, with no interest in the stores, because you assumed that they'd be looking after that for you. That often gets uh, translated as you know, bullies, not keeping their promises, um, exploiting small producers. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, I often find myself defending supermarkets. I'm not. Uh, defending supermarkets, but I am trying to point, draw everyone's attention to the real world that small businesses are trying to uh, survive in. 
So re relevance is everything. So more pressure on than ever in uh, Sean's world for these retailers to dif differentiate themselves. We can't all be stocking the same products. Otherwise, it is a race to, bo to the bottom. Well, we know that. We're at the bottom and we're suffering all the consequences. We might not be uh, contributing to this, but people talk with their wallets and we like this world where we're told you can have more for less. The government likes it. Consumers like it, they take it for granted and say thank you. We don't want to spend more on our food, thank you. Uh, what government's going to win votes by introducing minimum retail pricing? Some of us are old enough to remember that. That's what we need. I disagree fundamentally with Sean. I think you know, the, the, such is the dysfunctionality and so immature is the technology um, that it's going to take a lifetime to have all of those things adopted on farms so that we can deliver sustainable intensification. We need regulation and we need it now. In fact, we needed it 10 years ago. Because leaving it to consumers to work it out isn't going to happen. Leaving it to farmers to work it out isn't going to happen. Leaving it to retailers and, and, and processors to work it out isn't going to happen. So we're using metrics that are objective measures of performance, things like do people buy your product more than once, how many come here, to decide which ones we're going to get rid of because that's wasting everyone's time and space. So more pressure than ever on suppliers to invest in the customer, not the consumer. Jeepers, I'm so angry that people talk about consumers as one homogeneous mass and they forget the fact that there's a gatekeeper between them and the consumer called the retailer. The retailer is the organisation that they sell to. They don't sell to consumers, they sell to Tesco who sells their product to a consumer. So uh, we need much more market intelligence that's for Tesco, that's for Waitrose, that's for Arhold, that's for Walmart, that's for these other markets that we're interested in. If we think we can just start exporting with no knowledge about what people uh, actually want around the world, then all we're going to do is duplicate the failure that we've got in this country by assuming uh, assumptions are the mother of all ups. So SMEs particularly vulnerable because they have limited resources, time, expertise and cash, and... Um, it's just a strategic orientation that fundamentally is based on the fact that they love making things and they win prizes at it and take great pride in going to the shows where they get the prizes from and then assume that everyone will, will be impressed by their gold stars when they don't even, they're not actually at all. Uh, so the more limited your resources, the more important it is to target them. You can't afford to hit and hope. We come in 15 years ago with a project, we get the data from Tesco, we package it up, translate it, make it digestible for SMEs and give it to them for free. They become our laboratory. We now see how do you behave, SMEs, when the reasons for not knowing what's happening in the supermarket are removed. And it's a bit like pushing wet porridge up a hill or medicine down a sick child's throat. They hate you, mummy, because that stuff is disgusting. But they have measles, they have chicken pox, so you could have the medicine. Uh, and you'd be amazed how hard it's been to sell free insight, the richest of anywhere in the world, to SMEs that don't know what to do with it. And don't like to discover that they're selling currently to less than 1% of shoppers uh, in the markets that they're serving. That's not very palatable because it requires fundamental change to the way they run their small businesses. If you're interested in finding out more, then visit our website. So, we've worked with over 700 SMEs, we're now in our 15th year. They like what we do, it's impactful, and that means we can do some research with them. So we invest in this so we can have access, incredibly detailed access to small businesses. Uh, 100, 100 plus of them um, with whom we interact daily, weekly, and have been in some cases over a decade. So. What am I going to share with you now? First of all, these two elements. So I've touched on this already, strategic orientation. Remember, I'm not defending uh, supermarkets, but I'm now pointing out some of the things that SMEs do that they shouldn't do and some of the things that they need to do to take control. There was a, a slide somewhere about um, because we don't trust this industry, you know, Greta and co are doing things for themselves. Same goes for SMEs. Don't expect a retailer to look after you. Don't wait for government to fix this. You don't need policies to fix things if you have a clear, focused strategy of how you're going to win. Otherwise, you're relying on people that you can't trust, I think, which is government. So, <laughs> complementary and competing. There are lots of marketing orientations if you're a CEO or a senior manager or an owner manager of an SME. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got things that are complementary. So, I believe that consumers are important. I think I need to understand my markets and my, uh, and my competitors. 
Um, and learning is critical in that regard. Obviously, great connections there with the culture. But I want people to ask questions. I want people to be inquisitive. On the other hand, and we've got we published stuff. There's a whole bunch of references if you want to read about this. On the other hand, you've got these competing orientations: sales, production, and technology. And what you have cut into the chase is most SMEs, in my experience at least, are focused on sales. Cash flow is king. We don't understand marketing, so we'll employ somebody or we'll probably outsource this to a wholesale distributor that gets our product in front of as many people as possible with no marketing budget. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. So we sack that one and get another one. <laughs> or we get some first-time trialists who don't come back. We see our sales increasing. We think we're onto a winner. Whereas in reality, all we've done is we've attracted somebody somewhere to buy our product once who never comes back. And it could be 12 months before we work that one out, when then nobody buys our product. Because we don't want to know that. We just want sales. So I think the point about that is you wouldn't want someone like that defending your borders. Uh, and so are we fit for the purpose of playing the big boy in, in, a, in a bigger league? than the farmer's market or the deli, going in supermarkets. Um, so, oh God, uh, here we go. Or, so, second one, organisational justice. Some of you be, will be familiar with this. It stems from the employee literature, so organisational behaviour and HRM. If you treat people fairly, they will work so much harder for you. We've known that for a long time, and we've taken that principle and applied that to the supply chain. If you treat your suppliers fairly, then they will pay, reward you with higher levels of commitment, which means that your supply chain will be more profitable. The dimensions of justice, distributive, do, are the returns on your investment in that relationship commensurate with your inputs? Procedural, do you have a voice? Uh, informational, does the buyer explain to you why things are happening? And thirdly, do they swear at you or treat you with respect or answer your telephone calls? Uh, so if all these things are happening, I like working with this business, I'm going to be more committed and as a result we'll do better with them and they'll do better with me. Because I'll spot the opportunities that Sean believes exists for us both to make more money by differentiating the product. And a Tesco shopper has different DNA to an Asda shopper, to a Waitrose shopper. The Waitrose shoppers won't be seen dead shopping in Asda because they might kill their kids if they buy the meat that comes from Asda. And that was told to me in focus groups from micro shoppers that would not be seen dead because their children might if they shop in Asda. So, never mind their neighbours who would frown on them for shopping in such a store. Uh, key customers, what a key... So the next thing is the customer categorisation. Are you tweeting all of this? hope not. Oh, God. So, <laughs> he says, Waitrose wouldn't offer, oh, for God's sake. I should be out of a job after this. Right. Key customers ensure liquidity. Why do they do this, you're thinking? Uh, so, short-term cash flow and or confidence to invest. Really important. Investing in what? More stainless steel. Investing in more, more smart chef to develop new wonderful cakes, biscuits, jams and spams. Investing in what? Market intelligence? You're having a laugh. Who cares about that? We've got great products. They will wake up one day to discover that they are, and then we'll become rich and famous. So higher levels of codependency. Uh, so I need you as much as you need me. That needs to be managed. If you want Tesco or a big retailer to believe they need you, then make your numbers go through the roof by managing which stores you're in, how you're supporting the product, what promotions you might run, what media you might engage with. What are all those things? Can't cope with that. I've got another 54 phone calls to make before lunchtime with all these distributors that are asking me for more, for more products that I can't make. And my van's broken down. Um, and we've got problems with health and safety in the factory. Oh, my God. Suppliers need to be much more proactive and the buyers need to be supportive. So that leads me to this much more simplified diagram that says, look, if you want to be treated in a, in a, in a grown-up way, like a grown-up, in a grown-up game, then help the person that needs to give you another 30 seconds of their precious time um, or even give you any time at all, or when they do, be amazed that you've got an offer to help them make more money rather than complain about being late with their payments. Uh, by having a market orientation that puts the customer and the consumer first and a categorisation of customers. This is well established in the sales literature and the sales world. We don't treat all customers the same. Yeah, so we've got all these, all these people that are just contributing to overhead and we've got these people that give us a real good margin. And guess who do you spend most time with? They can order online, zero cost. We want conversations with these people. This is not rocket science. If we do that then we're more likely to have this happen so the performance will increase. So, 
what evidence, what evidence have we got to support this? So, 10 years worth of research all around the world, lots of anecdotal evidence, trying to get a bit more hard evidence. So we've done numerous studies because we've got this panel of uh, food producers that we're helping um, provide this insight to, who kind of trust us. I mean, it's great to see 80% of scientists are trusted. So I'm, I'm including social sciences in that, even if you might say they're not the same beast at all. Um, so they'll trust us. Uh, and we don't give them, you know, we're not consultants, we just tell them the way it is. You know, your numbers are going through the floor, you're going to be delisted. 12 months later, the phone call comes, we've got a meeting with the buyer, we think we're going to be delisted, can you help us? 10 years ago, I'd have tried very hard, now I say, no, it's too late. So, what do we discover? These are papers that we published. So, we look at the, inter the strategic orientation, we look at the levels of perceived um, justice in the relationship, we look to see the extent to which, or how, and the extent to which the customer in question fits their definition of a key customer. So one third, a significant proportion of our sales revenue. That's today, that's cash flow. Potential for sales growth in the long term. Smarter thinking business, that's forward thinking, 31%. Confidence to invest in long term development, even smarter in the hope that I can survive. So half, if you like, of our, of, our, of our sample have a mind or an eye to the future. A third have an eye to, uh, to the current. Um, and then we've got different measures of performance, both subjective, do you think you're doing a great job, and objective, like have you been delisted? Oh, we can see that you have. Are your sales growing? Oh, we can see they're not. So we have combined not just what people think uh, and what they say, but also what they do. What have we discovered? Two more slides and I'm done. So, lots of things I could share with you. I hope these are remotely relevant and interesting. So the stronger the market orientation, the more you care about customers and consumers, not the fact that you've grown these crops forever or you've made these cakes and biscuits forever and that you can't imagine a world where protein does not go moo or come from something that goes moo that comes out of a factory or from plants. If you can't get your head around that, then you're doomed to fail. Uh, the better and the, and the closer the fit in terms of key customer, my key customer does this, uh, and therefore I'm going to do that. It's called strategic alignment. The better the performance, customer satisfaction, sales growth, profitability, and absence of delisted products. You're more likely to be growing faster than the average. You're less likely to be delisted, and you're more likely to have happy customers if you do those things, because it shows that you care about other things than what you do. The relationship between fit and performance is positively mediated by, so the mediation role, as some of you will know, is what translates this force input with that outcome. So I've got my strategic orientation, uh, uh, and I've got my perceived justice that, that m mediates that relationship. So the more fairness the supplier perceives in the relationship with the customer, the more likely they are to go the extra mile, which is the academic term for commitment. Yep. So... If I go the extra mile, we're more likely to overcome that problem, to exploit that opportunity. I can drop this stuff and focus on you. I can't do that if I'm trying to serve all of the multiples. 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 stores each. I can't. And then I'm constantly hearing, oh, they stuffed up on that promotion. They didn't do that the thing that they promised. And whose brand are they working with? It's yours. It's not their promotion. It's your promotion. And you assumed that they would do everything just exactly as it's supposed to do. And as, that's pre as the previous speaker pointed out, there are good reasons why things go wrong. Not because, everyone's a, because people are bad, can't be trusted, but because there aren't enough resources to go around. Tesco have got 3,000 stores serving 20 million shoppers, hundreds of thousands of products, loads of reasons why things are going to go wrong. And they're more likely to go wrong if we assume that Tesco are going to fix everything, because they're not as indeed are not any of the other retailers. Sales orientation, we love that, brings in the money, has no significant impact on performance. If you are more sales orientated, you don't care about marketing, you want to sell stuff, you spread your resources far too thinly, you don't make more money. Lack of perceived um, uh, commitment, investment in market intelligence. I'm not going to spend my time worrying about this shopper or that market or that distribution channel. I'm too busy making prize-winning cakes and moaning about the fact they didn't get paid for them, and wondering why people aren't buying them, but not doing the research to find the answer. Uh, weakens the relationship with the buyer, so you're not doing anything to improve your performance. Where's your plan for making your performance improve? You haven't got a plan. Why is that? You're too busy looking after my competitors. 
a compelling reason why the buyer would say, do you know what, I'm not going to answer your emails anymore because you've known, not shown any commitment to me, whether I'm the biggest or the smallest multiple retailer. Um, length of the relationship has no significant impact on the relationship. So here's an interesting one. It's often felt that if you've been in a contract for a long time with a major multiple, you're okay. Things are hunky-dory. A, that's not true. And B, what it tells us is that suppliers make their mind up about the, about the justice with which they're going to be treated very quickly. So there is a window of opportunity for a, from a buyer's perspective to embrace new entrants. We're often, like the kid coming into primary school, you know, you, do, you, look, you look after yourself. Go some crying to mummy and daddy, and in the end, you know, bad things can happen, right? Because we assume they can make it, make it, do, make it um, work it out all by themselves. My last slide, so uh, there's loads more things to say, loads more things to share, but I've tried to get to the... And a lot of this stuff is intuitive. Most of what we do as social scientists, scientists is, um, is intuitive. What we haven't yet cracked is changing behaviour on the scale, which I think is necessary for Sean's vision of the future to actually become reality. So supermarkets have been guilty of abusing their market power. And no, there's plenty of evidence for that. That's why we have the grocery code adjudicator. But little or no attention has been paid to the behaviour of small suppliers, including farmers who claim this, this, this delivery is full of grade A carrots, onions, potatoes or apples. We know it's not true. They hope they won't get found out. Guess what? The technology that Sean's talking about will make sure it doesn't get, happen because those rotten apples will be well and truly spotted by the technology that the supply chain has installed to make sure you, upstream supplier, that we are also protective of, are not trying to cheat us too. I think they're often architects of their own failure. We all make mistakes. We all, have, we all make errors in our decision making. SMEs don't have the resources. Why do they spread themselves so thinly? They're asking for trouble. Not competent to play in this game. And these same businesses are the ones that we want to build this new export opportunity with. Haven't got a hope. Which is why I believe, and I completely agree, the horizontal collaboration, the vertical collaboration is an absolute requirement. Do you remember the old uh, grants for cooperative storage? Great piece of, I think, uh, of policy where back in the day, um, farmers were given grants for building grain stores, but only if those grain stores were for cooperative use. You only get the public uh, funding if you share the benefit with your neighbours and it makes sense. We need more of that, in my opinion. Relationship strength is a critical enabler. If people don't trust you, they won't talk to you, they won't share stuff. <laughs> farmers don't trust their neighbours, for goodness sake. The farmer next door is the... I've heard farmers telling me as recently as last week, you know, I'm better than everybody else. Why should I share my good practice with my neighbour who's useless? The new entrant thing drives me nuts too. Two-thirds of farmers are owner-occupiers. They've got no intention of leaving their land. They can borrow forever and sit quietly with the occasional game shoot and the occasional mumble grumble about the fact that they didn't make any money in their brown onions this year. So where do the new entrants come in that's going to in inject this? I'm enjoying this. Tell me to stop if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so relative strength is the critical enabler to success. But it takes two to tango. Don't keep blaming the big boys. Just eat the saying, do you want a piece of the community? You don't have to. In fact, don't if you're trying to differentiate yourself by not playing in that space. If you do, it better be good. Because look at who you're competing with. Oh, they're all those crappy global businesses that nobody would be seen dead in. I take my kid to McDonald's every Monday after we go swimming. He loves it. He loves it. And I'm not ashamed to say, we go there every Monday. I've got half an hour between the swimming and getting home. It's perfect. It's tasty. And he loves it. So he loves me too, right? So. <laughs> the potential for misalignment is significant. You're frowning at me, I know. I'm just trying to add a dose of reality. I don't disbelieve or disapprove of the aspiration for this wonderful world where we all care about one thing. It's not the case. And the task for changing that is humongous. And not one single NGO, not one single government policy is going to fix that. It needs to go across the departments. It's a generational problem. We've spent 30 years, 40 years or more getting to this state, this awful state. It's not going to be solved in two minutes. The potential for misalignment is significant in the absence of meaningful communication. Suppliers need to work harder to make their voices heard on the shelves. 
If consumers want your product, the buyer's going to bloody well stock it. If it doesn't sell, they'll delist it. It's as simple as that. They make no effort. All the effort goes into the ingredients. All the effort goes into the NPD and innovation in product. No one's thinking about the five seconds that people are making decisions about. Um, to make space in their minds and in their diaries. You want those large corporations with whom you are working to have time for you. If you want to read more, there they are. Thank you for indulging me. I hope that was interesting and relevant. <laughs>